So I'm starting on the camera today uh, just so we can talk about the next big thing uh, and it's work energy. So this is part of my series on uh, summary lectures for each chapter in an introductory calculus-based physics course. Um, I'm going on the content of Halliday, Resnick, and Walker 9th edition, but it's all pretty much the same unless you're using some uh, stranger and often better. Uh, my favorite textbook is, is a little bit different. So if you think about the first semester of introductory physics, there's three big things. There's really three big things. Uh, one is forces and momentum. We haven't gotten to momentum yet, but but it is, you know, F equals MA, F net equals MA, or the rate of change momentum, you can do it different, but that's one thing. The next big thing is the work energy principle, and that's where we're at now. And then the last thing would be angular momentum. So one of the things I'd like to point out when we're talking about work energy, it's, it's a different viewpoint on mechanics. And it's not real. I mean, energy is not real. Energy is an accounting system that really works well. Um, we find that if we can keep track of energy for a particular system, uh, it, it always turns out to be conserved well in terms of a system you can have work going into it. Um, so I, I want to point that out, number one, that, that it's, it's a way of thinking about things. It's a lot of times I find students don't want to use work energy. They would rather use F net equals MA, even for situations where work energy is much better. Uh, and there's some things that work energy doesn't do well. So you got you have both of those. And I left my window open for you today. Hope you like that. So work energy. Oh, the other thing is most textbooks, including this one, kind of break up work energy um, in terms of first looking at work energy and then looking at potential energy. Uh, so I'm going to follow along with the book. Uh, I'm going to talk about a couple things that the book doesn't talk about, uh, but I'm just going to do that. And, and again, my whole playlist is down below uh, in, the, the, in the description. And I'm not really going to work examples. If you want examples, you can just ask, and I, I, I can either, I have one already. You can search in the, in the search thing up there or wherever it is, um, but I'm just trying to get the summary, just, just the, the main idea. Okay, so let's jump into it. I'm going to switch over to the paper, and we can start talking about Chapter 7, Kinetic Energy and Work. Okay, so here we are. Chapter 7, Kinetic Energy and Work. That's what's titled. Um, so let's start off, I already talked about energy, let's talk about kinetic energy. So if I have a ball, and that ball is moving with some velocity v, and it has a mass m, well we can associate an energy with its motion, and we call that kinetic energy. And a lot of times people write it as ke, sometimes they write it as k, uh, in classical mechanics we write that as t, um, but it's all the same. It's, we can calculate that as one half m v squared. So if you have the mass in joules, if I have one joule times meters squared per second, I said joules, that's not true. <laughs> if you have kilograms and then meters squared per second squared, that's equal to the unit of one, one joule. So a joule is a unit of energy that we'll see. That's a J. One of the things also you need to know about this kinetic energy is that Velocity is a vector, so you might want to write this as k as one-half m magnitude of v squared. One of the things that we're going to really see is work and energy are both scalar values. They do not have a direction. You do not have a direction with the kinetic energy. It's just a value. It doesn't tell you which way you're moving, just a property based on both the mass and the speed. Okay, what about work? Now, the book defines work as, it, work. you can think of work as a way to add energy to a system. And it didn't really define systems too well, so I'll talk about systems too. Well, let's do that. So suppose I have some imaginary grouping of stuff. Like that, stuff, who knows what it is? And I have some energy input into the system. Well, then the energy of this whole thing is going to change. So one of the ways we can calculate the energy input is with work. So the book defines it as this. 
I'm looking at what it does this. Work done by a force, one single force, is F dot D. Okay, where F is the vector force, D is the displacement, and that's the dot product. We went, back, we went over that in chapter two when we talked about vectors. No, chapter three. There was, we talked about the dot product. I'm going to review it just, just in, in a second, just to remind you. Um, I don't like that because uh, this is a displacement, right? So if I have, uh, let's say I have this. Here's my x-axis. Here's my y-axis. I start here and I end there. So I could call this r1. I could call this r2. And then I could call this vector delta r. So delta r is r2 minus r1. And that's I think that's just a better, more mature, more grown-up way of writing the displacement um, because it incorporates all these things. Calling it d is, is I don't think, very, very useful. So I'm going to write work is f dot delta r. I like it better that way. Now this definition is only true if the force is constant and the relationship between F and delta R is constant. So you can't have like a, it has to be a straight path. It can't be uh, some swirly path, which, which I'll talk about, but it's more difficult to calculate. Okay, so let's review the dot product because that's what this is. So if I, suppose I write the force as a vector, I'm going to use the notation the book uses, Fx in the x direction plus Fy in the y direction plus Fz in the z direction. And then delta r um, is going to be equal to, I don't want to write delta a whole bunch of times. Let's write this as, I'll call it s. sx x hat plus sy y hat plus sz z hat. So these, are, these could just be numbers. Number, 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 number. It could be. Okay. So if I want to take the dot product here, I could, the way to take a dot product, F dot delta R, you take the X components and multiply them to, and, and multiply them together, and then the Y components multiply together, and the Z components multiply together, and then you add them all up. So it's going to be FX SX plus FY SY plus FZ SZ. And so then you see that all these numbers are scalars, so you get a scalar value. Now there is another way to calculate this. Oh, I didn't get enough paper. Let me get some more paper. I can tell. This one's going to be a, a four-sheet lecture at least. <clears throat> so suppose I have this. So that's my delta R. And then this is my force. I'll put it over here, F. Um, so I can do work is F dot delta R like I just did. But if I also know the angle, so this is, this is the delta r, it's a vector. If I know the angle theta between that, we can also write the dot product as the magnitude of f times the magnitude of delta r times the cosine of theta. Now, in both of these situations, you see something really useful. There's three situations. I'll just draw them out right here. So situation number one, I'll just write delta r and I'll say f and theta. So in this case, theta is less than 90 degrees. So the work done is going to be positive. Next, I could have this case, F. Well, I, I want to call that delta R. I don't know why. I, I feel like I'm moving that way. And then F. And then that's a right angle. If the angle between those two is 90 degrees, the cosine of 90 is zero. So this would give a zero work. You can have a work of positive joules. You can have a work of zero joules. And let's have this case, delta R, and then F this way. And then here's my angle. If theta is greater than 90 degrees, uh, but less than 270, so anywhere from, from here to here, and the force is backwards pushing, you're actually going to get a cosine value is going to give you negative numbers. So work would be negative uh, thing. And that is possible too. And that means that the force decreases the energy of the system. This force doesn't do anything to the energy of the system. And this adds energy to the system. Does that sound good? Okay. Next topic.
Uh, they have a thing about work done by gravity. I don't think it's super useful, but that's fine. We'll do it anyway. So suppose I have this, and then I have uh, a ball going from, let's say, y1, so it's falling, to y2. And I want to calculate the work done by gravity. Well, the first thing I want to do is calculate delta r. So delta r is going to be the final position minus initial position. So it's going to be 0 x hat. And then this is going to be plus y2 minus y1, right, because it's final minus initial, y hat plus 0 z hat. What about the force? f is going to be 0 x hat minus mg y hat plus 0 z hat, assuming this normal convention x y like that. So now if I calculate the work, it's just going to be f dot delta r, and that's going to be 0 times 0, 0. This times this is going to be negative mg times y2 minus y1 plus 0. That one's 0 times 0. Now, is this going to be a positive or negative number? Well, if it's going down, then y2 is less than y1. So this is going to give me a negative number, and then I have a negative sign over here. So if I'm going down, work is positive. If I'm going up, then y2 would be greater than y1. This number would be positive, and I have a negative sign, so uh, work would be negative. So if you're going in the same direction as the gravitational field, the work done by gravity, okay? Don't think about the work done by something else. Don't think about potential energy. We haven't talked about potential energy. The work done by gravity is positive going down, negative going up. What if I do something like this? Here's a fun one. I go right here to right there. So this has uh, x1, y1, let's just do it in two dimensions, it's a comma, to x2, y2. Well, in this case, now I'm going to have a different delta r. So now I'm going to have delta r is going to be the final position, uh, x2 minus x1, x hat, and then plus y2 minus y1, y hat, plus 0, z hat. If I take this and dot it with this, f dot delta r, notice that this is multiplied by 0. So it's just going to be 0. And then I'm, I do this again, I get minus m g y2 minus y1 and then plus zero so i actually get the same thing and and that's one of the things you'll notice is that horizontal motion doesn't do anything if i'm only moving in the x direction because the component of force in the x direction is zero for gravity then i'd get zero work okay so in this case only the vertical stuff matters and we'll see that's really important later when we get to potential energy Okay, next, springs. So springs are super useful in physics uh, because it turns out that we can approximate a lot of interactions as though it were just a spring. Here's one that's, that's really nice. This is a rubber band. It's not a spring, but it's kind of springy. And, and, it, and it behaves a lot like a spring in some situations, um, and that makes it fun. But in general, a, a, an ideal spring, the, the more you stretch it, if I stretch it that way, it's going to pull back that way. So and the, if, the, if I double the stretch, it doubles the force. So that's one of the things is it's a non-constant force. And in the x direction, this is the way the book writes it. It says we can draw it like this. So say I have a spring right there, and this is at x equals 0. And then I stretch it. There's x equals 0, x equals 0, and this is x. Then the force, fx, is going to be equal to negative kx. So this is one way to write it. I don't think this is the best way. Um, this says that the force is proportional to the, the position. k is the sp called the spring constant. It's basically how stiff the spring is, and it has units of newtons per meter. So a stiffer spring, if you stretch it the same amount as a weaker spring, will have a greater force. Now, I like to use, there's two ways I like to write this. I prefer to write this as just F 
equals ks. And not put the negative sign, because this is the magnitude and that's the magnitude. And so you have to know the direction, right? If you want to, this is not wrong. I just don't like it that way. Uh, the other thing is, what if, what if it doesn't start at x equals zero? That's a little bit more difficult. I mean, so imagine this is my origin. And then I, I start right here. See, I have a rubber band. And then I stretch it. In that case, let's say this is x equals zero. And then I stretch it over to here. Obviously, the force is going to be back that way. But how would I calculate that? One of the things you need is this unstretched length. Let's call that L0. And this is the way my favorite textbook does it, so I like to do it this way. In that case, I can calculate this vector, L. I'll call the length of the rubber band L. It's from where it starts to where it ends, and it's a vector. And with that, I can say the spring force, Fs, is going to be negative k times um, the magnitude of L minus L0. But see, then if I do that, then this is a scalar. That's a scalar scalar. How do I get this back as a vector? I'm going to multiply by L hat. So L hat is a unit vector in the direction of L. So L hat is going to be the, mag the, the vector L divided by the magnitude of the vector L. This looks cumbersome. Uh, and a lot of times you can avoid this. But if you're doing things like numerical calculations in Python, which uh, I can I can post a link to that down below, uh, tutorial on that. And you, I think you should, I'm not including that in the video, but I think it's an important thing to do. So, so make sure if you're interested to look at that. Um, it's the way we do physics now anyway, is this idea of a numerical calculation. But this allows you to calculate the force as a vector and then model what happens after that. And it's super useful. Okay, what about the work done by a spring? Let's think of this in just one dimension just to make it the simplest case possible. Um, so suppose I have a spring and this is at x equals zero, and then it's attached over here. This is unstretched, so f equals zero here. And I'm using just one dimension, f equals zero newtons. Uh, so I don't have to worry about vectors. And then I pull it over to here. So it's like this. And I want to calculate the work done by the spring over that distance. Well, I have I have a problem because here's my definition of work. Now, in this case, I can write f as just some uh, constant fx x hat. It doesn't have any y components, and I can write delta r as uh, delta x x hat. So f dot delta r, this is just going to be fx delta x, and that's fine. And then I can put in my value a negative kx delta x. But you'll notice that the more I move, the further I move, this value of the force increases. So I can't just go from here to there uh, in, in a simple way. And in fact, I need to break this into tiny, tiny, tiny steps. If I just go a little bit and calculate the work, and then a little bit more and calculate the work, and so forth, I can do it. And I, the better I, the smaller this interval, and in fact, as delta x goes to zero, this becomes the real answer. Okay. And so now you see that really what we're doing is work is equal to the integral, in this case, from x equals zero to x final, I'll call it, let's call it s to x equals s of f x dx, right? I'm going to let that delta x go to 0, and I get this. So now I have the integral from 0 to s of negative k x dx. And k is a constant, so let's pull that out front. Negative k, and then I can integrate x dx. That's not too hard. You choose the power rule. If I have x to the 1, I raise that by 1 power and divide that by, by that 1 power. So I get 1 half x squared from 0 to s. Now I just plug that in. I get one negative 1 half k s squared minus 0. So the work done by the spring is this negative value. 
And in fact, we can generalize this to the, uh, yeah, that's, that's what we want. The work done by the spring is negative one half KS squared for if you're stretching it. Um, if it's going the other way, if you, if you have it stretched already and you let it go back the other way, you just switch these limits of integration, you get a positive number. But that's the work done by the spring. And this is the important thing, the work done by a variable force. This works for any force that's not constant. Uh, I like to write it in general, work equals the integral from r1 vector to r2 vector of f dot dr, where this is really going to break into, line integrals can get a little tricky, but nothing complicated in this course. Uh, this can break into the integral from x1 to x2 fx dx plus the integral from xy1 to y2 fy dy plus the integral from z1 to z2 fz dz. So you have to know the function of f and how it changes in both the x, y, and z direction and then you can calculate that. And we're going to do that in the next chapter too. We're going to do some practice with that. Okay, one last thing is power. Power is equal to time. No, that's a joke. It's actually not true. Right? Time is power. No, wait. Money is power. Money. Time is money. So time is power. I was right. <laughs> that's an that's a old joke. Okay, so we define power as the rate of change of work. So it's dw dt. Uh, and, and a lot of times we can write this as delta W over delta T. Uh, and this has units of joules per second. And that's equal to a watt. So it's how fast you do work. Uh, one of the common things that, uh, that you look at is suppose, well, one of the examples, suppose, and it doesn't come up that much. Suppose I have a force pushing on here, and this is moving with some velocity v. And, and we don't need to worry about the direction that much. Um, suppose it does that. And, oh, did I ever write down the work kinetic energy theorem? This is the whole point. Well, I'll put it over here. Work is the change in kinetic energy. That, that's like a big deal. Big deal. Right? It's a big deal. This says that if I have some system, the, the work changes the energy of the system. And at this point, the only energy that we have is kinetic energy. Okay, so that's how we connect these two. That's work and kinetic energy. That's the name of the chapter. So suppose I, I'm pushing on this with some force um, and it's moving with some velocity v. Now, let's just take a super, super, super short time interval such that it moves some distance and the velocity doesn't really change that much. So we can call this uh, delta r is the distance. So I can calculate the work. Work is going to be, it's the same direction, f. No, it doesn't have to be. So it's going to be, let's say f is that way. And this is the angle theta. So it's going to be f delta r cosine theta. That's the work done. And that's going to be equal to the change in no, that's fine. That's all I want. So now I want to know the power this force does for that object. So I can say power is the change in work over the change in time. So if I take this as my change in work, F delta R cosine theta, and I divide by delta T, I have delta R over delta T. And delta R over delta T is the velocity. So I get F V cosine theta. And just as a check, uh, let's check this has units of newtons. A newton is a kilogram meter per second squared, and then I have meters per second, and that's going and then that has no units, cosine is no units. So I get kilogram meters squared per second squared per second. So this has units of joules, that has units of seconds. So joule per second is indeed a watt. Okay, so again, just a reminder, I remind you this at the end of every video, um, this is just a summary, okay? Uh, you still have to read the book, you still have to work practice problems, you have to come back and watch this again, pause it, watch it in slow motion, watch it in fast motion, it doesn't matter to me. If you have a question, ask. I like to answer questions um, and stick at it. It doesn't, you don't learn this stuff overnight. It doesn't happen that way. 
You have to keep working at it. If you get confused, that's good. That shows you're doing something. It's like going to the gym and getting sweaty. It means you're doing something. If you watch this and you're not confused, if you're working on problems and you're not confused, it'd be like uh, going to the gym and walking on the treadmill at the slowest speed. You're not really getting any exercise if it's not really challenging you. So it's good to be challenged. Keep at it. You can do it. And I'll talk to you next time.